start. So look, we're actually in the assignment today. Uh, at 10 o'clock, so that's why you were given some free readings. And uh, the idea was that you do the free readings and bring some questions to class. And if there's something in those free readings and articles that you couldn't understand, myself and Ian will then answer them in this session. And the, the background of that is that we want to come to this uh, quiz prepared and with the information very fresh in your minds. So that's why we wanted to get it out of the way and get this learning outcome ticked off so we can get into the fun parts, which is practicing the software. So I'm going to go through this slideshow, which again I made available to you on PDF, but some of the slides will need some backstories and background filled in, so that's what I propose to do this morning. Question policy would be, you ask some to me, if you want, put your hand up, and I'll ask some questions to the group as a whole. And uh, I think we may have some new people in. If that's the case, uh, I don't know how, how we make your quiz today, because if you didn't have access to the materials, you may want to fill in an SAC and get it through the system, and we'll work out how to uh, work, fix that later on. It's just that we worked our calendar, our timetable, and starting on Monday, but I know enrollments have been messed up for people, so we'll do our best to help fix that if that is the case with anybody in the room. So the a construction project brief, from the readings you've done then, would anyone care to try and say what they reckon a brief is? Anyone have any idea what a brief means? There must be somebody in here, I mean, if you haven't read the stuff, you're going to find this quiz a bit tricky and you won't get off to a very good start in this course. So surely if you read those readings, which were put up on Monday afternoon, you must have some idea what a project brief is. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. Um, statement of needs and requirements by whom and to whom in the case of what we're studying. Sorry? So the client would be what would he be providing? The requirements. So he's basically, look, basically what a brief is, he's saying it's a statement of a problem. The problem is we've got, we need to design a shopping center, we need to design a leisure center, there's a need for a new school, there's a need for a housing development, and the city's expanding like Auckland or wherever. So how do you define what's needed? Because the designer can't read people's minds the same way tutors can't read students' minds. We have to try and probe and find out, well, what is it? What do you need? What course are you after? And the success of the design or otherwise will depend on how good the communication is between the client and the designer. So you've got to clearly state and articulate what it is you want. Otherwise, you can't complain if the architect doesn't do a building and you say, well, it doesn't do what I wanted. I wanted a different room. I wanted a coffee shop. I wanted a library. Well, it's not written down in this uh, document that you gave me. So it's like briefing someone on what they have to do. You look at these kind of Star Wars or movies, war movies, and the guys get together for a mission. Our mission is to design a building, construct a project, and we've got a whole lot of background information to do before we even get started, okay? So yeah, statement of requirements. <coughs> so this uh, learning outcome, the, the importance, implications of defining a thorough project, including elements such as site, client, constraints, so defining is how you actually explain what it is, state categorically, clearly what it is, so the person you're communicating with can completely understand it. So if it was an architectural competition, you'd want to make sure all the people entering are getting the same information so that they're competing on a level playing field. So some criteria, factors would be the site. So what kind of things would the designer need to know about the site, do you think? And this is common sense, so don't worry about putting them on ANSI you think might not be so clever. What kind of things, even very basic stuff about a site, what do you think an architect, if you come to my office and tell me, yeah, I've got a site, what can, what's one of the first questions I'm going to ask you? See, so, yeah, somebody said something sensible there, shout it out again. <coughs> yeah, exactly, where is it? Is it in Auckland? Is it in Hamilton? Is it in Northland? You know, is it overseas? Do you have to travel to get a look at it? Because most uh, designers will want to visit the site, and some architects think it's a crime if you don't. But I guess with Google Earth nowadays, maybe you can do it a bit better. So you've got a site where it is, and the physical things about what size this is. Is it on a slope, like this lecture theater? Is it flat? Is it urban? Is it rural? The client? Okay, what types of client do we have? 
So who would want to design just a simple house, do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a domestic, you know, just a single plant, right? Whereas if you were doing a, a project like a leisure complex for Auckland City Council, that's a client body which could be 20, 25 people. It could be a school for a board of governors. It could be like the home they did for Unitex. There's different types of clients as well. And you might want to find out is it a government client, public sector, which is government or private. Constraints. Do we all know what constraints means? Is anyone here not sure what a constraint is? <coughs> So everybody in this room knows exactly what a constraint is, yeah? So can someone, if I'm going to pick on somebody then, okay, so it'll make you a bit nervous. So all you people on the computers up there, I'm going to ask you, yeah, I'm going to ask you, sorry, you just looked up first. Give me an example of what a constraint would be, and maybe towards a building project. You're not sure. See there, everybody says that we know what constraints are, but they're not sure. So you do this quiz, you're not sure. So anybody else want to be honest and tell me they're not sure? Or does anyone want to have a guess? And that's okay, this is the place to be wrong. This is the place to discuss it. So what do you reckon the constraint is? What do you think it is? Oh, you're a bit sick? Okay, I'm gonna go somewhere else. All right, that's no problem. All right, what about you? What's the constraint? You don't know? Oh, this is really good. And you obviously know her, so that's great. I'm gonna ask Tom first, all right? Do you think he's right? Yeah. So Tom said something that may impose restrictions on what you can build. Okay? So you may have a council planning regulation that says you can only build a certain height, or you may have to fall within certain rules that define angles so that you don't cast shadows on your uh, next door neighbor's property, or it could be setbacks from the road, that type of thing, or maybe as much as a zone to say that this is a residential zone, <coughs> this is a green belt, this is commercial, heavy industrial. So if you want to put a tire factory or a nightclub in the middle of some kind of housing estate, the council may have problems with that. So basically a constraint is something that puts limits on what you may be able to put on a certain site, okay? So that's what a constraint is. It may be a physical constraint where you say, well, the site's only so big. But some countries take that as a real challenge. You look at like Tokyo, the plots of land are so narrow and yet they have created some very innovative living spaces and really use the spaces to a premium and to the best advantage. So some designers really take that as a challenge to be risen to. Okay, so constraints, if you don't know what that means, hopefully that little discussion will clear that up. Time, what, what, what's the time factor here? Why do you think it's important? Okay, Ramesh, good man. You should sit up near the middle, man, if you're going to talk. This is great. Uh -huh. What do you reckon? So go for it. Time pass. So we plan, we plan, we plan something and, and over, overnight it. Yeah, well, do you know where you guys have got to get assignments to do? And there's a deadline. We say, well, you have to do this assignment done in three weeks. It's the same with the project as well. So you're not going to come to me and say, yeah, I'm on a school. Yeah. All right, okay. When after? Just take your time. It's all right. Not really. Well, there's kids here, but they can go into caravans for a couple of years. They'll be worried. All right? But so normally, people will say, we want this project at a certain time. And say if you're doing a hotel and some kind of holiday island, you say, well, I want to get it open for a certain season. So your deadline is, I need it open by May in the Northern Hemisphere, November, whatever down here. You may be doing something like a shopping center. And you may say, well, I want this open for Christmas because that's when people are out buying presents for all the family and that may define when the opening date is. It could be a football stadium. I mean, do you remember all these Olympic bids? Remember Brazil? And they were trying to get these stadia all finished in time. Uh, the minute I know the team that I follow in London, they've got a stadium that's meant to be open in a couple of weeks. It's not going to open in a couple of weeks, but uh, you know, they, I think the clients there are really pissed off about that. And it's cost nearly a billion pounds, which is two billion New Zealand dollars. You'd think for that money, they should have been able to finish it. but. It's crucial to know how much time you've got, how much time you can allocate to digging up the research on the site, conceptualizing ideas, putting those ideas into a format that people, the clients can understand, come back to you with recommendations, defects, or whatever it is, taking it to council, how long will the council take to process the application, how long will they take to get back to you, 
Resource Management Act, building control. These are all things that will come into this time equation. And then you're trying to work back from the deadline saying, well, look, guys, we need to be here. We need to have this out to tender. And, you know, you just don't have an infinite amount of time to do the project. So normally the brief is going to define, listen, we need this done by a certain amount, uh, nine months, six months, two years, depending on the scale of the project. Cost, we all know what cost is. Everybody's concerned with money. What do you think the quality could come into? <coughs> Anyone have any idea what that might refer to? What's quality mean to you? Yeah. Who? Who's this man? Yeah, Antonio. Yeah. Use it's a what? Use of products. Use of products. Well, I mean, say uh, if you were looking at, say, a Ferrari car, and then you were looking at something that was maybe. I don't know, like a Lada or something, right? I don't mean to knock down any country's cars. We, my country's make cars. But you might say, well, that's a more high quality product, but you're going to pay more money for it. If you look at banks, for instance, the banks are like the cathedrals of today. Or, you know, because in the old days, cathedrals used to, well, we're the church with so much money. Look what we can build. We've taken your money, painted with it, sculptures with it, created these vast things. <coughs> banks nowadays say, look, give us your money. We're going to put it somewhere safe. We've got loads of other people's money already. Look at the floor we've put down. It's great, isn't it? Look at the finishes we've got. Whereas in a hospital, you might say that people are going to be buying the trolleys around, rushing people in. People might be sick. The finishes might be a bit more practical, functional, and not quite like marble or terrazzo. So the quality of finish, it could be like a Hilton hotel or it could be a budget hotel. And you're saying, well, okay, the carpet's going to be a more industrial one to take lots of wear and tear. So Again, this is a question that you're going to put to the client. And you know, when the client brings a brief to you, some clients know what they want, others don't. I have plenty of uh, clients going, oh, you do it, go for it. I don't really know what I want. And then the very first design I gave them to them, they all of a sudden go, yeah, well, actually, I didn't want that. OK, great. So we're going to change it. But at least the conversation has been started. And the design is starting to move along a little bit, which is much better than a big blank page like what we got here. So. These are just some little factors, but there's others. And part of uh, the same you'll do next week, the client requirements, you'll see some as well. Okay, so our learning outcome is to know about construction briefs. <coughs> and this of course is going to be part of that. What is a brief? <coughs> the most important stage in the whole of the design process. And look, <coughs> the instructions you tell someone are so crucial as to the, the outcome of the design they're going to produce. And if you don't give them the complete picture and they leave something out, you can't sue them later on or complain about it, you know, because you didn't provide the complete set of instructions or a complete brief. So it's got to be adequately described and in detail. And I'm, I think some of the buildings I've got on here afterwards, I'm going to show you examples of that. So a brief is basically a statement of the problem or a statement of the need for the building, school, church, cinema, leisure centre, either new build or refurbishment. So it could be an old kind of church, old uh, buildings like the front of Unitech, that um, kind of hospital building, which could be repurposed or an adaptive reuse. This one, is anyone from Tauranga here? Tauranga? Oh, Ian? Do you know this building, Ian? No. OK. <laughs> you should get out for that. All right. Uh, look, this is some kind of Mariah or cultural building. And it's actually very, very important because I think the architect who did it, uh, the company, it's called Jazzmax, which is one of the biggest firms in New Zealand. And uh, I think they did to Papa and Fjord, for the seminal buildings throughout the country. The architect who was the lead designer, I think he's passed away now, but he was very interested in doing something that met the needs of the iwi and the users. And the, the local community were very keen for this building to meet the requirements of a thing called the Living Building Challenge. <laughs> what that is, it's all about sustainability. And it's not just putting light saving bulbs in. You know, we chat about sustainability and all the climate change that we're seeing at the minute, the heat waves in Japan or Greek fires. Not sure exactly what's causing that, but some people think it's down to emissions. So this building here had to meet such a serious set of criteria, and it wasn't something you could say, well, if you do five out of the 10, it's okay. This living building challenge, if you don't get them all right, they say you're not getting the certification. It's even down to using lead-free paints things without mercury, and they've got this red list of materials. If you use them, you're not certified. 
it's zero energy, zero waste, and uh, zero water, I think, as well. And it's got, you know, harvesting rainwater and things. So what I think I'm trying to say is that the, the client here really bought into the architect's kind of mission statement to try and make this a really eco-friendly, sustainable building. And that was something they stated right at the start. And the brief was expanded to meet that. So the brief, if I could come to you with a brief, and you might say, have you thought about this? And the brief could start to develop a little bit. So that is something which happens as well. If you're down, this is a nigh to, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, I'm not even going to try this one, but the Living Building Challenge, if you look it up, you'll see it's a really, really tight uh, <coughs> sustainability, sustainability certification. <coughs> started in America, but it's not throughout the world, not in different places, and the <coughs> Jazz Max uh, bought into it and served it in a big way in this building. Now, when you're working, you want to get paid, and the type of building, of which there's many here, and no one expects you to learn these off. I'm just showing you that uh, part of the brief. When you're getting the first discussions underway with your client, you might want to know, well, uh, excuse me, how much am I going to get? And uh, depending on which country you're in, it could be a certain percentage, and it could depend on what type of purpose group the building belongs to. You know, well, it's a kind of a, even though it's a big building, it could be a shed, but other buildings, like we've got air traffic terminals here, very highly sophisticated something like hospitals would be very sophisticated and highly serviced. <coughs> Maybe even laboratories that make semiconductor chips for uh, memory chips, I think they are even more sterile than surgery wards, I believe. So that's the kind of ones that would need very intensive briefing before you could start to commence design. So sample of fee skills, building classification, and that could be something that's part of your briefing discussions. Um, design is not an exact science. Some people might take concept from somewhere. Uh, others may pose problems of circulation, fire safety. Um, design develop any scheme little value unless the client's needs are being fulfilled. So you could do a really beautiful looking building, and yet does it actually serve the purpose for which it's intended? An example might be Sydney Opera House. So does anyone know that building? Does anyone in here not know that building? If, if you don't, it's probably one of the most famous buildings at by a century, really iconic structure for Australia. And it cost a lot to build it. And uh, they didn't really know how to put the foundations on it at the very start. But it's a beautiful building. They want to keep it there for 500 years based on the maintenance program. But some people would argue it's not the best opera house in terms of acoustics. So there's where you say, well, okay, have we compromised the real purpose of that building just to get a beautiful work of art? Maybe. Uh, so you may find that this building is actually a house in Parliament in Germany and the idea is that you can, if you go to Berlin you can walk up around here but the, all the MPs are around here and the idea is that the public or the people can see them working and after Germany was opened up and got together I guess they wanted to make it look as if it was more open society based on the history of the country I suppose. So architectural competitions <coughs> Uh, an office I worked in one time, we had to do a church for one, and we got a document which was about 25 pages telling us what happened for all these kind of people celebrating these religious services and how important things were and how we had the addresses and the design. And it was very, very complex. And ironically, the guy, my boss, he, he wasn't religious at all, uh, agnostic, and, uh, but he did a great design. He won the competition, which is funny, but uh, he did a great job of it. So in a competition, you really have to state exactly what's needed. And I think this one as well, Tupapa, was a competition. And, you know, when the people want to enter it and they pay on their fee to enter, you're going to get information back which could take the form of a brief. And you'll read it. And if you have any other questions, you'll send them in to the committee who will probably try and answer them and send out the answers to everybody. A bit like a, a news forum query in Moodle. Now. Yes? Well, a brief can be used in an architectural competition, but not every architectural project is a competition. No. I'm just telling you that, you know, I've got Yeah, I mean, every project I would say should have a brief. Because otherwise you say, well, just you get started, what are you designing, whatever you want. You gotta tell them what the building is. And then to say if it's a swimming pool, all right, is it just one pool, is it three, is it a diving pool, is it a spa? And right away you're starting to bounce so on and develop the thing, you understand? But all I'm making the point of the competition here, Rochelle, is that a 
if we're competing, you want to make sure everybody's competing on a level playing field, which means that everybody's getting the same information, and it's got all that level of detail to allow you to really produce something that meets the needs of the clients. Is yeah. Um, I'll admit, no, no, I wouldn't okay. say it's that common. I mean, the real star architects, right? If you look in the magazines, a lot of them have done competitions like Renzo Piano, Norman Foster, you know, Daniel Levestein, you know, that thing in New York after the Ground Zero after the competition. <coughs> uh, I think when I started working with practice for that one, the very first job was a competition. We didn't win that one, but it was just a new way of procuring work that that practice went down. It's a bit risky because you can put so much time into it and then you don't get anything back. You don't get a consolation prize saying, here you go, Rochelle, good effort, lovely drawings, but we give it to somebody else. Yeah. So it's just one way of doing it, but in terms of the brief, every project should have a really clear statement of what's needed, whether it's a list of rooms or something's called a scheduled accommodation, or it could be some special factors relevant to certain buildings, you know, which could be cultural things. Yeah. Like I say, in that church, the guy designed it, he wasn't religious at all. So he could have done whether it's a church for Christians or a mosque or, you know, he was just able to read the stuff and see what was important to that people uh, and produce something that was suitable for their needs. Uh, I mean, look, it's quite common here for the yeah, SSA these star people. So if you look at Toronto City Hall, Amsterdam, there was Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, that's quite a famous building. Uh, one of those things kind of me. But, um, I think that was one of the most expensive buildings in the world for a while, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. So uh, you can see, getting back to your question, it is reasonably um, common at a certain layer of architectural practice, maybe not the likes of myself who did roof space conversions and stuff uh, when I worked for myself. Um, we went in for a couple of competitions, as I say, but the one that we won was just bad. The guy was a much better designer than I was. So it's not uncommon. But as I said, it's a bit risky. Uh, these are some of the buildings that people have used, uh, one like competitions. That one up there is the Sydney Opera House, so you may have seen it. And if you're into architecture, and I'm hoping you are because you're doing this course, um, you know, you do a design and develop environment course, I think. Uh, you know, <coughs> you'll be asked to kind of try and appreciate things like this. Does anyone know what this building is? <coughs> Ever seen it? No idea. They don't know what type of building it might be, so we don't know what the building is. So let's guess what it might be. So you're looking at something here, which is got a grass roof. Any idea what that is? What do you reckon? What do you think? What type of building is that one? I say, is it a school? Is it a FBI headquarters? Is it a church? What do you reckon this? Parliament, that says there. Parliament House Street, exactly. So, so there, nobody can read. <laughs> Has anyone been in this building? Okay, well, it's just if you ever get to look at the entrance, it's really like a spaceship. So, Australian Parliament, some of you should know this one. That one up there is a competition. This one here again, Spain, competitions. And how you define, these are very complex, these are art galleries and you know how you get the light on the exhibits without damaging them and stuff is very complex and that building has really lit up that part of Bilbao. Listen, if you've got your phones on, unless you check into that thing, please knock them off. We don't want distractions, so I hope, I don't want to say it every lecture, but um, that was the one, yeah, we had one. Now, information, let's get back, uh, my thing is broken here, so I'm gonna have to just walk around. Uh, clients needs to be clearly defined, so I can't kind of emphasize enough that you as a client have to instruct and provide the information to the designer of what it is exactly you need. Now, these are just examples of stuff. Could be a site layout, could be the parking, could be access, uh, you know, loading for maybe a supermarket, could be the finance, how you get to the finance, uh, what's your business plan, how much money can I spend, that could affect the quality. Local authority demands and statutory approvals could be restrictions. Like that uh, church one that I showed you there. If I just go back a little bit. This is a slate roof. 
and red bricks, and that was a constraint that was put on by the competition brief. <coughs> they said, look, this has to be, 800 people have to fit in here, but it must be red bricks, and it must be natural slate. You say, well, so what then? Well, natural slate can really only go down to 22 and a half degrees, so it meant that that building could end up looking like a big square pyramid, unless you did something quite funky the way that designer did to try and break it down. So sometimes the restrictions will impact on your design, in fact, nearly always, I'd say. Um, environmental requirements, you may have to do an environmental impact scheme to see what impact your building might have on the ground, the groundwater, ret uh, retention tanks, septic tanks, or maybe wildlife. That's something that could come into it as well. And factors specific to the particular project, if it's laboratories, for instance, which is a building I'll show you soon, uh, that was one we had an awful lot of uh, discussions about. List of rooms, crucial. State must define their needs. What's going to be done in that room? Is someone going to be a jeweler where they need some task lighting? Or is it something like a classroom where maybe some lights a certain height above the plane of the working plane is sufficient? Uh, is it going to be something that they're working on dry or a wet environment, in which case the light fittings have to be some special high-tech waterproof fittings? Okay. Is it going to be security? Is that a factor? Is it going to be something that needs privacy to stop people hacking it? Is it going to be a storage archive? Is it a factory? Is it a production line? All sorts of questions which do not need a degree in architecture, guys. They're just common sense. <coughs> and if someone had a gun to your head, you probably would ask those questions in real life. Okay? This way, I'm not going to read right the way through it, but I just want to pull up a few things. That I, we're seeing this word finite. That means something which is kind of complete. And a finite brief is where the client knows exactly what he wants. So it could be someone like a hospital. And I used to work for a health authority, and the hospitals say, this is exactly what we need for this operating theater. And they had a big list of all the equipment, all the gases, all the vacuum, all the lights, all the you know, carbon dioxide, and different things that needed to be provided in that room. So as an architect, we weren't saying, well, have you thought of this? Because they had already thought of it. But sometimes you'll get new types of buildings. I mean, 30 or 40 years ago, you know, kind of uh, internet cafes or some kind of IT learning resources, libraries have totally changed. The architecture professionals had to respond to that and maybe ask questions at a brief which is not so clearly defined. So if you're asked a question about what is a finite brief, look for an answer that says it's something where the client knows exactly what he wants, it's kind of a complete picture and they're able to instruct everybody uh, of what is necessary in this room or this building. So I say this one chats about hospitals and nucleus templates, which was just a template. I mean, even McDonald's has got a template for cafes. I had a friend who used to work for them, and they had, I mean, that's where they look like they landed from space, no matter what the site is. But they've got what they see as a very efficient template for supplying you guys with burgers, and us being able to sit there and eat them quickly. So um, that's. Look out for that word. Finite means kind of complete, well known, and it doesn't have to really be expanded. And this is an example of that nucleus template, these kind of crosses. So all the services and lifts come up the middle, and these are like wards. There's different kind of theatres and operating theatres. So uh, the only scope we have as designers there was to kind of use fancy cladding on the walls, on the roofs. But the floor plans, you know, apart from creating a few little courtyards, we were kind of a wee bit restricted in what we could do. Uh, this one would be a finite brief, and um, what this is for uh, an aquatic science research development building. And when we went to meet the class for this, one of them was studying freshwater fish in one part of the country, and the other one was studying fish that were from, uh, you might need to, if you want to do this quiz to you, you might want to look up, all right, because if you don't pass it, I'll just say, well, you didn't pay attention. Um, Saltwater. And this building was really, really complex. The client body was a group of scientists who were biologists, geologists, all sorts of people. And um, up on the roof, there was a tank of seawater. And uh, they didn't tell us that until we were nearly on site. And I said, the structural engineer, we just found out we have to provide not just a big tank of seawater, but also a concrete kind of thing to put it in. So if it leaks, it doesn't wreck the whole building. But the structural engineer had obviously over-designed things. He just went, no problem. I said, what, you don't have to change anything? No, it'll be okay. But uh, 
the point I want to make here is this building was so highly serviced, and we actually had to put in special interceptors in these sinks to make sure that they weren't mixing chemicals that would cause an explosion when somebody flushed something down the sink in one lab and it went and met one from another lab. Um, there was a radioactive room in this as well, which they didn't do a very good job of telling us about it. And about two weeks before it opened, uh, the government went and inspected and came back with a big list of faults. And my boss pulls me in and said, look, they've said, oh, this is wrong with this radioisotope room. And I thought, okay, this is not good. And uh, it turns out we went back to the briefing document and we were able to see that they hadn't mentioned or told us what was needed in that room in terms of little care to special flooring and special lab work touch to stop radioactive substances getting stuck in crevices and then making people come out for three years at the end of the day. So we got away with that one purely because the client had not briefed us correctly. So ask questions, uh, especially in buildings which are non-standard. And don't be afraid to expand it and record everything. Because you, uh, especially in New Zealand, apparently you're more likely to get sued over here than you are in my country, which is, can happen a lot. So just try and keep your backside out of the courtroom as best you can. This open brief one would be where a client is not quite sure, or it could be a new type of building. And it may be a building of what there's not really any kind of precedence there before, so you're in a way reinventing the wheel. So if you see what an open brief is, the client is not exactly aware of what the specific requirements are, or may be unable to predict future fluctuating needs. So you could say it's something to do with the library. Like I said, the British Library opened about 20 years ago, and it was right on the cusp of the internet revolution, and that actually did make massive changes to it uh, near the very end, because to take account of all the new ways of looking at IT. Okay. Um, in many instances, client needs to develop a design and model flexible could be factory buildings, which may try to think of what future production techniques might be. It could be a school, which, you know, nowadays people are in offices are looking at these kind of hot desking arrangements, whereas in the old days people were like in little kind of punches, you're in that office, you're in that office, and part are outside and that's it. Or it could be open plan, or it could be uh, a proposal where the client wants you to allow the flexibility to change the, the arrangement, movable walls, maybe further down the line to respond to changing technologies, yeah? So that's an open brief, different from a finite brief. Things might want to be more flexible. They're much less uh, you know, defined, and the client probably hasn't got an exact list of what he needs. Um, again, this one, yeah, control limitations. Yeah, that's just saying that there was a kind of cultural aspect of this building and the designer didn't necessarily have to come from that cultural background. Um, I was really involved in the design of this one. I, I was involved in doing a lot of the production drawings and the details. And I guess it dragged me in because I had worked in a similar building before. And because this fella was uh, not from that background, so we could help him out. But he didn't need any help. He was pretty much a really talented architect. Um, but the finance will also affect what you can produce. Uh, attitudes, energy saving measures, building fabric, finishes, how, what do, do they want the building to look like? Do they want it to make it a real flagship building, like an Ikea store or something that's noticeable? Or do they want it to be something that blends in with the landscape and uh, hidden? So there's lots of different things you might want to know about. This is a university building. And I used to have a little video about it, showing the design, and it was really good because when the client uh, met the architect, who's one of my star, architects from the UK called Richard Rogers. He's done things like the Welsh Parliament Building and the uh, European Court of Civil Human Rights and all this. So really high-flying. If you look up their website, you'll see some pretty amazing buildings. But in this one, the client said, yeah, we want a library. OK, you want a library? What do you want in it? Books, book storage, offices, yeah. But then they said, look, what about when people are studying? Sometimes they want a break. You want to give them somewhere to go and maybe have a coffee, recharge the batteries? Oh, yeah, never thought of that. So the discussion moved on to additional accommodation that would make the building be better, uh, more useful to the clients as in the students, and also maybe look towards the future and what type of, see there, a brief then evolved. So that's saying that the brief the client came with was kind of developed with the discussions with the designers and thinking about how they housed new things like CD-ROMs. Uh, you know, in the old days it was microfiche and books and magazines. 
And nowadays, there's other ways of storing data and information. Okay. What's that said? The client may not understand the reasoning behind detailed brief design. So sometimes, if it's a competition, or even, I think the NZIA, you can see here, they provide little guides to clients to say, look, if you're going to thinking of appointing an architect, this is the kind of stuff they're going to need. This is the kind of questions you should be asking them, and this is what you can expect them to ask you back. And look, I've made a bold here, an intuitive understanding, allowing sufficient time for formulation of the brief. If you rush it, you might find that the building suffers as a result. So a, a failure to prepare, prepare to fail. And there's even stories where people have lived on the sites with the clients to try and get a better feeling. I don't know if I've put the slide up here. Yeah, I have. See this top one? It's a Newcastle in Fontaine in England. It's called the Biker Wall. And the reason it's called the wall is that the back face of the big motorway. And the designer said, well, look, we want to try and blank out the nose from all the, the noise, not the nose, <laughs> the noise from all the cars. And so they said, we're going to just make a very blank elevation to that side, and we're going to open it up to our faces of sun and create gardens and hanging balconies. And in fact, the landscape architect came over to my university and did this workshop for a week. So he told us quite a lot about this, and he and a few others actually lived on site for quite some time to try and understand better what the people wanted, OK? Because the people were moving from buildings that looked like this, which can sometimes create issues. And uh, they want to try and make things a little bit better, more human scale. And this one, I think, is the one they're going to knock it down to try and create something which is maybe not quite so uh, intensive and maybe overbearing. So I think the message we're trying to tell you here, guys, is the better the brief, the better chances you have of doing a successful building. So nobody asked me any questions here. Nobody seemed to want to talk at all. So as I seem to assume that all you guys are happy to have you any questions about what you were asked to read? Um, yeah, go ahead, shout out because I can't hear you very well. With the brief, yes. is it in a report form or a list form or is it included in the brief? Is it in a report form or is it included in the It's going to depend on the type of work, okay? So if it's, I mean, I'll be honest with you, quite a lot of the work I did in my personal thing, the clients don't have a brief, they just go and you kind of interview them. Yes, yes. You know, they just know that they want the building. They've got a statement of some kind of thing, but they're not sure what they want in it. And maybe John B. or me, they might say, well, okay, I never thought of that, or have you thought about this? I mean, I remember going to a job in Scotland, and um, then this guy wanted to extend something. And I seem to remember, um, well, I walked right in and said, to her, what's that, what's that? Okay, and she said, let's knock that down, knock that down, and knock this down, we're gonna, I said, sorry, what are you wanting in? It's not okay. <laughs> and he did, he just did what I, it turned out okay, actually, you know, I mean, he threw me back over for the opening on, but that was great. But I remember that was quite an extreme thing. I probably shouldn't have done that, but it's, um, yeah, but he was quite happy with it. But normally, it doesn't have to be a formal thing. Um, but look, your way your office works might be a way of kind of gathering information. And once you start a job fight, you will record this stuff. And it may be because later on they say, well, hey, you didn't, this building doesn't do what I wanted to do. Oh, excuse me. Here's the meeting we had. Here's the notes I had. I sent you them to an email. You signed it off. So, if you want something else now, that's additional costs, additional work, additional fees. So it's just again a case of keeping everything organized and recorded so to protect yourself. But if it's an architectural competition, you can expect it to be a really big brief. Yeah? And sometimes they do the design and build competitions where you might have an architect working with a contractor and they'll do a proposal. And those things would have to be very clearly defined as well. And again, it might depend on the type of project. They might say, here's the site. I mean, I remember in a city I worked in, they had a theater, and they had three different sites. And the, the, the brief was, look, you come up and decide which of these sites you think it should be on, and justify it, and give us your design proposals. So it doesn't have to be a report. It can take many forms. But I would say the ones I'm familiar with are little booklets stating what the thing needs. And as I say, that church one especially was getting right up to all the, uh, the symbolism of why they had to process and the different, I mean, I remember doing that and saying, well, okay, there's doors there, yeah. I said, look, I remember going to these churches and people are dead, and they always have to hunker down carrying coffins. That's a pretty morbid thing to say, but I said, well, look, why don't we do bigger doors? Why don't we make ones wider so that they can just walk through with a bit more dignity, you know? And I think, oh, I never thought of that. So, you know, this is kind of things that came about as there was discussion. So, does that answer your question? 
Okay, thank you for that. Anybody else? Any questions? I think everybody's name begins with R. On Ash and Michelle, they seem the only people asking questions. So, any questions over here? So, do you know what the Australian Parliament building looks like? No. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not a question of the quiz. <laughs> well, it sounds like you guys are all experts since so the pre readings must have been great, Ian. I'm really yeah. good about that. So, you can have a break, and what's going to happen is uh, we will go back to our rooms. You're going to go back to the same people that you had on Monday. If anybody wasn't here Monday, we'd try and sort out where we put you, and you can tell us why you weren't here Monday or what the reasons were for starting late. Now, just before you close things, uh, the quiz is going to be under exam conditions, so that means your bags are going to be at the front. You will log in to Moodle. It's under the uh, course uh, project brief intro tab. It'll become available at 10 o'clock. It's a closed book quiz. If you're seen using phones, you'll be disqualified. If you're opening all our tabs, you'll be disqualified and you can have a meeting with our academic leader to explain why you were cheating. So we want to take things seriously. We've tried to prepare you, hence this lecture, hence the pre-readings. It's not a very hard quiz, guys. You could probably do it even with common sense, but hopefully with the background info we've given you, you can get some good marks and start banking some credit towards your final grade, all right? So has anyone any questions about where they're going to go or who with? Uh, Ute's group that Polisi covered on Monday, she's not back, I think, till tomorrow. So Tina will be- Monday. Is it Monday? Okay. So anyway, today Tina's going to be looking after you. So she'll be in that room, 114, 1003, and uh, admitting the test and also helping the Archicad. She's a bit of a guru in Archicad, so she'll help you develop your skills, okay? Is there any other questions? No? Not, we'll call that a wrap then. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry, your time was made out, Michelle.